We've been in 1 John, and we're studying it, we're um, learning all about the author and the audience, and so 1 John 5 is this week, and so we're wrapping up the book, and he, the author of 1 John is giving his um, departing exhortations to his audience. So he's written this whole letter to them, giving them some directives, giving them some um, exhortations to do and to follow. And he's, he's leaving them with some last parting thoughts. And so today we're going to focus on those, but we're going to focus on one verse. I'm preaching on one verse today. That's what we get the week after camp, one verse. So, and the, uh, so we're going to focus on 1 John 5, 21. And this is what it says. Are you guys ready? Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. This is the very last, is the very last thing that is in the letter. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Um, this is the very last thing that the author wants to leave us with, and so he's instructing them to keep away from idols. And an idol is any object, person, or imagination that we form that fuels a false form of worship within us. A false form, you can write that down. You can follow along on your U version notes. Um, and and so it's it's a false form of worship. The, f- the first commandment, anybody know what it is? Yes. Or you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me, right? And then the second one is don't make images, don't worship idols, right? And so idolatry is the act of shifting the worship that is exclusively, everyone say exclusively, exclusively meant for God over to something or someone else. And let, make no mistake, the human creature is a worshiping creature. The human creature is a worshiping creature. We are wired for worship, Pastor Ross says. We are wired for worship. Um, St. Saint, Saint Augustine says, we are all designed with a God-shaped hole in our hearts. And so... There is a longing, there is a, the world is broken, there is a worship that we are all wired to do, and, and sin happens when we take things of the world, when we take um, something that is not God, and we put it in the place where God should be. It's just how we're wired, it's just how you were designed, we are all kind of wired this way to medicate, to um, We know that the world is broken, and so we want to do something to fix it. Um, On Father's Day, how many of you dads just like to fix things? (laughs) And we just want to, we want to fix things. And so we're all designed to worship, and we use different stuff to do that, to to satisfy. Everyone say satisfy. I heard a pastor this week say today uh, that today we live in an idol factory. We live in an idol factory in our culture. Everywhere you look, there are things to try to compete for your worship. Uh, we live in a world of busyness, instant gratification. The idea, Pastor Brent talked about a couple weeks ago, your happiness is the highest ideal to us today. Do what makes you happy, right? Pastor Brent said, that's terrible advice. <laughs> that's terrible life advice. People say, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. And so, in fact, instant gratification is the norm in the world today. People are lovers of pleasure, and they want it now. How many of you know, remember Veruca Salt? The original one. I don't know when it was made. That That was before my time. I want it now. One scripture that I think defines the climate of our spiritual culture in America is Philippians 3, 17 through 19, and I love it in the message version. Let's read it together. There are many out there taking other paths, choosing other goals, and trying to get you to go along with them. I've warned you of them many times. Sadly, I'm having to do it again. All they want is easy street. They hate Christ's cross, but easy street is a dead end street. Those who live there make their bellies their gods. Belches are their praise. Gross. All they can think of is their appetites. 
I just think that really encapsulates the American culture today, right? Our, our bellies are our gods. Our stomachs are our gods. Our hun- yes, it's, it's very good. Yes. Our desires. And so I think if we had an idolatry problem in, in this room and in our culture, I think it would be our stomachs. It would be our desires. Um, in our lives, hunger or desire will lead us to do all sorts of stuff. Your hunger or your desire will lead you to do all sorts of stuff. At camp, we, um, so this is kind of, I, I shared this message at camp, and um, I, had, I had a couple students come up to compete for some always delicious Chick-fil-A. And so I ordered some Chick- a couple Chick-fil-A sandwiches two hours before everyone showed up. They sat in the back, and I pulled them out in front of everyone. Oh, my God. It's so good. I don't, I don't know what it is. I like, I don't want any of this. This has been sitting there. But they, it was like the best thing that they could imagine at that moment. And so I called a couple students up. I said, all right, you guys want to compete for this? And they're like, yeah. And I, I filled a, a cooler of ice with ice water. And I don't, Misty and I did it the other day. I was like, put your foot in here and let's see who can last longer. <laughs> and so we did it and we're just like, oh. We're like just in pain because we're babies. Um, I don't does anybody do ice plunges in here? Oh, you're so awesome. Wow. <laughs> and um, it was hurting. So I made them stand in there and they were just like, everyone was cheering for them. But they were in serious pain until one of them gave up and got out right. And so the point is, hunger or desire leads us to do all sorts of stuff. Your desires, whatever they are, it's, I mean, Chick-fil-A sandwich is an example, but you have your own hungers, you have your own desires, you have your own wants, and they're constantly at war with your spiritual life. They're at war with what God wants you to do, and, and, so, and they lead us to do all sorts of things. And everyone is designed to eat. How many of you enjoy a good meal? It's good, right? Um, we all love food, you know. A classic example is like Whataburger versus In-N-Out, right? And I always, I'm just like, I don't understand. They're both trash. It doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> but I will say, In-N-Out does not have bacon. That is their fatal flaw. There's, they don't serve bacon. I'm like, yeah, I'll take a cheeseburger with bacon. They're like, we don't have bacon. I'm like, okay, I'm not coming back here again, so you just lost a customer for life, (laughs) ma'am. But we're all designed to eat. We're all designed to consume. We all have hunger, right? We all know what it means to be hungry, right? And what is it? Your body is a sign that you are going to die if you don't do something about it. And a lot of, you know, in our culture, we don't really, (laughs) we don't get too close to that (laughs) very often, as where other parts of the world, they, that's a very real thing. But hunger is also a theme in Scripture. It's everywhere. And it's because you and I understand hunger. You and I, it's a common experience. It's a very human thing. Everyone in this room knows what it's like to desire food. If you've ever lived with a pregnant lady, you know that that desire can become very real very quickly and become very dangerous for all those involved. And so... We know what it's like to want something that you can't have in the moment, right? And that's what hunger is. It's like, I want it, but I don't quite have it, but I'm, I'm going to go get it. Like, it's a, it's a desire that is very uh, much we can all identify with. And so, in Scripture, there's a lot of analogies to our spiritual life. When you're hungry, you have an array of options to choose from to achieve the desired outcome, right? Depending on what you put in your body, you'll get a specific outcome. So, if you put good things in your body... You'll get good things out. If you put trash in your body, you're going to f- have tummy aches, okay? And so we all have spiritual, emotional, and physical appetites that we allow to influence our actions. And so the scripture is full of these analogies. Um, there are so many. You can it, it, you just look through, read some of the scriptures. You got Adam and Eve, right? The one time the woman decides what she wants for dinner, and... <laughs> We're all stuck in sin, am I right? (laughs) Hey, it's Father's Day. You can't say anything to me today. (laughs) New joke, yeah. Misty's heard that like a hundred times. 
And so uh, we're going to look at a story today about hunger. Everyone say hunger. And I think it'll inform our understanding of what the, fir- of what the writer of 1 John means when he says, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Okay, so let's just keep that in mind. And we're going to look at the story of Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau. And so who is Jacob and Esau's dad? Isaac. Yeah, someone raised their brother. That's awesome. Good job. Isaac. So he has these two sons, and he was married to Rebecca. And it says, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first one came out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. It's just very weird. It's just like a baby Chewbacca. It's just like <laughs> appears. I don't know what that's about. After this, his brother came out and his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter. How many of you like hunting? Anybody? A skillful hunter. Yeah, one person. There you go, yeah. A man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob, right? So there's these two characters. We got Jacob and Esau. One of them's like shops at Bass Pro Shop, likes all the hunting stuff, camo. The other one kind of maybe shops at like Bed Bath & Beyond, really likes all the cooking utensils and the soft, you know, the, the thread count is really important to them for their bed sheets. And so, you know, you have Esau, he likes to run around and elk urine or whatever. He, and like, isn't that a hunting thing? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thanks, David. <laughs> I've never done that, but apparently David has, so <laughs> can ask him about it. And so Jacob is a really good cook. He's, he, he, and he makes what? A really good stew. Very good. You guys have read this before. So let's continue. Uh, okay, so we have two, two different guys, right? And they're both competing for their father's attention. And so once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. Everyone say famished. That's a fancy word for hungry, yes. My son, he's two years old. He goes around, lately he's been, when he gets hungry, he says, I think I hungry. I was like, oh, wow. He keeps saying I think before everything. He's like, I think I'm tired. (laughs) I'm like, all right, man. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Ooh, everyone say, ooh. So um, Esau was out hunting, doing his thing. He comes in, he's super hungry, and Jacob is making some stew, and he says, sell me your birthright. So you can picture this scene, whatever, you can put whatever food you want. I'm not a big stew guy. I like, like, I don't know. If you've ever had Leland make some really good bread. So here's a shout out to Leland's new bread company. You can order some, some good bread. Leland goes to our young adults group on Monday, Monday nights. But um, that's why I picture like some nice, whatever food, whatever food makes you the happiest. Just go ahead, use your imagination, put whatever food. And the smell is just wafting out of the tent. And it looks like a cartoon. The, the smell just picks you up and floats you into the tent, right? And and so and he's so hungry. He's he's out there. He's being a man, killing stuff, running around, building things. And he comes back and he says, "Give me some stew." And what does Jacob say? Okay, sell me your birthright. And so that birthright, we don't really. You read it, and maybe some of us in here don't really understand. But if you were the firstborn, you got birthrights. How many firstborns we got? Yeah, firstborns, right? Uh, Here are some things that a birthright includes for the firstborn. Number one is a double portion of the inheritance. Um, It caused the firstborn to be seen in the will as though they were two people. Yeah, what happened to those days, am I right? I'm the firstborn, so. Uh, Number two, they get a leadership role. The firstborn became the chief executive officer of the family business, okay? So they... Um, in the event of a disagreement in how things should be run or done, they get the deciding vote, okay? And his brothers and sisters had to defer to him. And the third thing they get, last and most significantly, they get a spiritual blessing. 
he acted as the priest of the home. And so in Abraham's family, this is pretty important. <laughs> That's a pretty big blessing, right? Abraham gets promised that he's going to have so many descendants, his family's going to be so powerful and all this. He, he keeps getting blessed, and, and it just keeps trickling down the family line. And so this is a really important spiritual blessing that he gets. And so Jacob's cooking some stew, and he sees he saw super hungry, and Jacob says, well, sell me your birthright. Right? Sell me your birthright. Um... So uh, let's continue reading. Verse 32, look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore north to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. And this is kind of what I want to talk about today. First John 5 says, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. And the truth is, you and I are a lot like Esau. We're out there living our life, doing our best, working hard, and the enemy is kind of like Jacob. The enemy is making a big pot of stew for you, just like the one that Jacob had for Esau. And it's a recipe that is cooking up death, the death of God's highest plans for you. And I think too often we trade our momentary desires for God's best plan for me and for you. Uh, Hebrews 12, 14 through 17 in the message says this, watch out for the Esau syndrome, trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. You will know how Esau later regretted that impulsive act and wanted God's blessing, but then it was too late, tears or no tears. Did Esau get a good trade? No, it was a terrible trade. He traded his inheritance, all of the money, all the spiritual blessing, all of God's highest plan for him. He traded it for what? A bowl of soup that would satisfy his hunger in the moment. And the thing is, was Esau really going to die? No. No. Right? Is he, was he really going to die? No, he was confused with his desires in that instant, and his desires led him to make a terrible decision. And so the, here's the point. The enemy always wants you to trade the ultimate for the instant. The enemy always wants you to trade God's ultimate plan for your instant right now desires. And the crazy thing is we live in a culture that encourages this. We live in a culture that says, yeah, sleep with who you want. It's okay. You can have anything you want to, whenever you want to satisfy any desire that you have, right? Fast food, it's so good, but it provides a synthetic processed meal that satisfies your hunger, but is not good for you, right? Social media is simulated relationship. It's simulated relationship that does not fill you with the thing that real community can do for you. That's why it's important to go to a groove. That's why you can't just listen to podcasts and be like, yeah, me and Jesus, we're good, man. <laughs> you, you, gotta, you gotta have real relationship, right? Pornography is simulated sex that provides the chemical release of sex without the beauty and the connection that strengthens a marriage, right? It's like we're, we live in a culture where our stomach is our God's, and we're living to satisfy the momentary aches in our bellies, and we're trading it for, um, we're trading that for God's, we're trading God's greatest for that. And Satan knows what you desperately need to understand. This is from Levi Lusko's book. Desires can keep you from your destiny. The calling God has on your life can be silenced by the desire to feel good in the moment. Um, let's read this verse again, Philippians 3, 18 through 19. Many live as em enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is their sh shame. Their mind, everyone say their mind, is set on earthly things. You may, we may not be out in the field dancing around a big statue chanting <laughs> in the middle of the night, right? But we... You and I know 
that there are things in our life that have taken the place of where God should be. And our worship and our screen time and all of these things are a representation of where our worship is because we were wired for worship. You and I are worshiping creatures. That is what humans do. And so um, in our culture, we worship our stomachs. We worship our desires. That is the leading factor of how we decide to live our lives most times. And that's part of the human experience, right? It's part of maturing. It's part of becoming a disciple. Like we're having to live in a broken world and you yourself are broken and we're not going to be fixed until we get to heaven. And so that's part of it. But there are things we can do to not just eat that bowl of soup and trade it for, like, and lose out on God's highest for us. And so uh, the old adage still rings true. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. And the issue may not even be sin. Um, and I'm kind of realizing this a lot lately. I constantly have this thing in my face. I'm just like, always. I can't see where I'm going. Maybe I'll walk off the stage. Maybe I won't. Like you, this, I can't hang out with my kids when this is in my face. I can't have a real relationship. And it's not like it's, I got to, I, I need this. Like, I need money. Like, this is, <laughs> I need, like, to work. I need, like, this is important. But I'm constantly filling my life with things. I'm filling my life with busyness. I'm filling my life with phone. Netflix, right? How many of you love a good Netflix binge? It feels so good to just get off of work, go home, next five hours, <laughs> right? Turn off your, your brain. It just, it feels good, right? But the problem is you fill yourself with these things so much that there's no more room for God. And you're just, you're full. Like when you eat, there is a limit and then you don't have any room for anything else. And so you're getting your fill on all, and they might not even be bad. It might be your business. You're like, oh, I got to do this for my family. I got to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. Uh, Pastor Ross likes to say, uh, order determines capacity, right? You got to prioritize the important things so that you can fit the right stuff where it's supposed to be. And so because of this, you're, man, I just really need to relax. I need to watch a good Netflix show just so I can get my mind right for the next day. So you don't go to a group, you don't read the scripture, you don't do these things, you don't attend church faithfully. Um, and the thing is, most of it is fake. Most of it is simulated. Most of it is just so you can stimulate a part of yourself that is not going to last. Um, It's entertainment that numbs your mind, right? I think that's a big thing for me is I just want to turn my mind off. I don't want to think about all the, I don't want this to happen. I don't want this to happen. So I'll just think about this. I'll just think about the next scroll. I'll just think about the next thing. And it numbs your mind and it, it distracts you. And so then you end up, I'm not satisfied. I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. But you're numbed and you're stimulated. It's instant gratification. And so the devil is cooking up his stew, his stew, and it's going to kill us. Our culture, and our culture, and we're smiling. We're like, this is awesome. This is so good. This is so fun. This is so cool. And we're eating that stew, and we're, we're drinking this stuff. We're having a great time. All the while, we're dying spiritually inside. Our relationships are suffering. Our spiritual life is church Sunday to church Sunday, or problem to problem. And that's just not how God intended us to live. And so, I, you know, I, don't, I wonder this morning if we could begin to stir up a real hunger for God. A hunger for the right things. A hunger for his word. A hunger for his presence. A, a real hunger that goes down to our actions that every day we are filling ourselves with the scripture. Every, every opportunity we can, we're showing up to church. Every opportunity we can, we're helping somebody in need. Every opportunity we can, we're going to a group, going to all these things, instead of trading them for just a way to medicate ourselves, a way to numb ourselves, a way to stimulate our minds and our spirits. And so today, I don't want this message to be about something that you have to do to fix yourself. I think a lot of times we come to church and it's like, yep, I suck, <laughs> you're right. I know it, and that, yeah, that's the truth. We, you know, 
I, I suck. We all mess up. We're all, we all need a, a bit of fixing. But today, I don't really, I don't want this message to be about that. The only way you can, uh, I think, develop a hunger for God, um, the scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And the only way you can taste and see the Lord is good is if you have an encounter with him. And Christianity is more than church. It's more than just the Bible. It's more than just a small group. There's no magical song that they can sing that will get you to that place of spiritual enlightenment. Christianity is more than that. One of my favorite quotes by A.W. A. Tozer, this is um, kind of a longer quote, so... If you've been sleeping, just wake up for a second. For it is not mere words that nourish the soul, but God himself. And unless and until the hearers find God in personal experience, everyone say experience, they are not the better for having heard the truth. The Bible is not an end in itself, but a means to bring men to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God, that they may enter into him, that they may delight, everyone say delight, that they may delight in his presence, may taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God himself in the core and center of their hearts. I just think we've lost it. We've lost it in our culture. We've pursued happiness God is here to help us reach our goals, but the truth is he is the goal. And we're getting full on other stuff. And we're so glad to get rid of that ache in our bellies that we forget about the destiny that God has for us, about the ultimate, the, the goodness of God. David cried out in the Psalms, as the deer pants for water, so my soul longs for you. And we don't even know what that means because we're just trying to be happy. We don't even say that because we're just trying to get God to medicate and Jesus to help us not be sad. And so a longing for God needs to be stirred up. A longing for God needs to be procured in our lives somehow. Uh, we're going to keep reading here in A.W. Tozer. He says, I want to deliberately encourage this mighty longing after God. The lack of it has brought us to our present lowest state. The stiff and wooden quality of our religious lives is a result of a lack of holy desire. Complacency is a deadly foe to all spiritual growth. Acute desire must be present or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. He waits to be wanted. Too bad that with many of us, he waits so long, so very long in vain. And so this morning, I want to invite you. We're going to stir up a hunger for God if you will allow it. Um, I think we're kind of addicted to control in our lives, and so it's totally possible that you come in here on a Sunday morning and you come in, in control and then you leave in control. Pastor Robert Morris says, true worship can only take place when you abandon yourself. Everyone say abandon. When you abandon yourself, there has to be abandonment of yourself or else it's not really worship. It's you came and you sang some songs and then you left. There's something more, right? There's, there's something deeper. There is an encounter. There is a taste and see that the Lord is good. You know why going to youth camp works? Because instead of teenagers going home and scrolling on their social media, because instead of teenagers going out and being idiots with their friends, instead of teenagers doing all the stuff that they do, for three days, they don't do those things. And you know what they do? They look to Jesus. I, I can't, there is no other formula. You can't have more of God if you're already filled up on other stuff. So all of these students, all of your families took out time, energy, finances, and you know what happens when we do that? God is faithful to meet us. He is faithful to show up. The scripture says that the enemy has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Our minds are blinded. Our minds are numb. Our eyes are looking down constantly on, our, on, on us, and we forget to look up to, to Jesus. And so this morning is your chance to become 
to, for God to restore you to the joy of your salvation. This morning is our chance. You made the right decision this morning. You came here. You created room in your schedule. Um, Psalm 23 says, um, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. God is, I believe this morning God is preparing a table for you. He's preparing a table for us. You see all these analogies to hunger. You see all these analogies to food. And so the thing about hungering for God, I think we think a lot of times it's like eating our vegetables. <laughs> I got to pray. I got to do this. I got to do that. It's, gr- it's no fun, but you got to do it. And there is, a, there is an element of that, but Jesus says that I have come that you may have life and life to the full. And so um, we're going to taste and see that the Lord is good this morning. The scripture says it's his kindness. Everyone say kindness. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's, it's not guilt. It's not shame. It's his kindness. The scripture says he is a rewarder. Everyone say rewarder. R- rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him. Scripture says you can come and have peace that surpasses understanding. The scripture says taste and see that the Lord is good. And so this morning, we're just going to come as we worship. This is a moment between you and God. I don't know what you've been consuming. I don't know what you've been filling your life with. I know in my life, I can make a little more room for him. I can work on my hunger for him. I can make a little more um, effort for him to show up in my life. And so we're going to come and we're going to come to the table. and We're going to take communion together. As you think about hungering, as you think about filling your life, Jesus has the ultimate table set for you. Scripture says he is the bread of life. The scripture says that that man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's like, well, we have to. There is a hunger that we can satisfy with the Lord. And so let's read this together. This is... Um, Jesus, he's talking about his flesh and his blood, John 6, 53 through 56. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Remain in me and I in them. Let's... If you go to 1 John 5, which is what we're studying, (laughs) the last verse is 20 and 21. It says, and we are in him, everyone say in him, who is true by being in his son, Jesus Christ. He is a true God in eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. And so at the last supper, Jesus broke the bread and he said, when you do this, remember me. When you do this, let your mind be fixated on what I have done, on who I am. Remember me. And I think too often we forget. Too often we're full of other stuff and we don't remember. We forget who he is and what he does and what he has to offer. And so when we fill ourselves up on the right things, we fill ourselves up with Jesus, your life will begin to change. Your priorities will begin to change. Your desires will begin to change. You won't need to medicate with using this other stuff because you have Jesus. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. These next few moments are for you and God. And uh, we're going to take time to practice. Everyone say practice. We're going to take time to practice longing after God, hungering after him. And this is, I, I can't do this for you. You have to do it yourself. And so let's just, if you would just take that communion cup and I want you to look at it. I want you to think about all the things in your life that you used to fill. I want you to, I want you to really have a moment between you and the Lord this morning. And then I'm just going to pray and you can take that as you feel led between you and God. But Lord, we come to you today and we repent of filling our lives and not leaving any room left for you. This morning, God, I pray for every person sitting in these seats that they would taste and see that you are good. 
that you're not interested in just behavior modification for behavior modification's sake, but you are a good God who is personal, who is interested, who, when we surrender our lives, when we structure our lives around you, you give us life. And yeah, we're broken, and yeah, life is a mess, and yeah, the world is just in, a t in chaos, but God, you are a God who of order you prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies and so god tonight we are this morning we approach the table we approach the table and we that you've set before us god we we believe i believe that you set this table long ago maybe for this morning there's someone in this room and you and they have felt far away from you god i just ask that you would remind them that you are setting the table for us you're getting all the placemats out you're getting all the food ready you're 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 preparing it just for us to come not to worship not to apologize but god to have a meal with you to, to feast, to hunger, to, to be filled and satisfied. And so God, we ask that you would be with us here in worship. I ask that your Holy Spirit would just fill us. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name.